Alright guys, welcome back to the channel. If you're new, my name is Bobby. Guys, before I start the video, yes, I've seen it in the comment section. Thank you so much for the well wishes. It is true, I was a little bit sick the past week. Now, slowly but surely, I am recovering, alhamdulillah. Guys, today we're going to react to Scholar paid 2 million to find mistakes in the Quran, shocked by what he found. Before we jump into the video, guys, support your brother Bobby here with a thumbs up if you enjoy my content and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Comment down below and share the videos if you can. All right, guys, with no further ado, let's have a look. This is Professor Marin van Putin, who received a whopping 2 million euros grant by the European Research Council whopping to indeed. linguistically take apart the Quran and figure out whether it lives up to its extraordinary claims as a perfectly preserved book originating in the middle of the 7th century. Let me stop this real quick and read this out. Five Leiden researchers have been awarded a consolidator grant by the European Research Council. This grant, up to 2 million euros, will enable them to continue and expand their scientific research. The ERC consolidator grant is awarded to promising researchers of any age and nationality with between 7 and 12 years of postdoctoral experience. They can use the grant of up to 2 million euros to fund a team of core researchers and support staff over a five-year period. So this is extremely impressive, of course, but we have to clarify the 2 million euros are not only for the one scholar, but they gave him 2 million euros to conduct further research, which makes this whole claim even more grandiose because it means they really want to dissect the Quran from every possible angle and engage a whole team into the matter. This is quite interesting. Century. Before we get to what his analysis revealed, it's worth quickly going over the standard Muslim timeline. This gives us a frame of reference to compare the professor's scholarship against. In 610 CE, Prophet Muhammad وسلم, receives his first revelation. In 632 CE, the Prophet وسلم, passes away and all revelation ceases. By now, the Qur'an right. has been entirely memorized and inscribed on various perishable material. In 632 CE, um, from various written material and men's hearts, Khalif Abu Bakr anhu gathers the Qur'an into a single book, Mus'haf. Note, the Prophet died this very same year. On the That's 25th year of the Hijra, 647 CE, Uthman anhu standardizes the Qur'an back to Qurayshi dialect throughout the Muslim lands. The period between the Prophet وسلم, death and standardization of Qur'an is about 15 years. Now, bear this in mind. This is the crux. Bear in mind that no other religion has anything that can compare to this. According to the Muslim sources, None. the Qur'an was standardized by about 647 Uthman. CE by the third caliph, Uthman radiallahu anhu, and it is this claim that's being tested today. Now, one last important thing before we get to the professor's remarkable findings: What does standardization actually mean? Well, from the time of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam to the third Caliph Uthman radiallahu anhu, a fifteen-year period. The Qur'an could be recited in seven Arabic dialects called Ahruf. Exactly, and this is what the Islamophobes use against Islam. They say that there are many different versions, however, those are just dialects. Now, this doesn't mean seven different Qur'ans. Exactly. It means the seven readings of the Qur'an are the same. But there are it. minute dialectical differences in how certain words are pronounced and spelt. This flexibility existed to assist the non quraysh Arabs with their recitation. What's important to remember is these seven readings are mentioned in authentic ahadith, and so they're a part of the canonical readings of the Qur'an. They're not corruptions, and they certainly don't impact the theology. So the standardization process was basically Caliph Uthman anhu restoring the Qur'anic recitation back to the main Quraysh dialect, always the most popular one that the Qur'an was originally revealed in. Of course, what? because Prophet Muhammad wasallam comes from the Quraysh tribe. Aye. Because by about 647 CE, the different Arabic dialects were starting to confuse the new Muslims joining the growing caliphate. 
Now to our academic, a leader in the field of historical linguistics, who specializes in the linguistic history of Arabic, Berber, and Semitic. Marin van Putin, PhD, 2013, of Leiden University, who focuses his research on the textual history of the Quran and the early They're history showing his phone number. I don't think that's a good idea. of the Quranic reading traditions. For your information, he's not a Muslim, and his only motivation is to subject the earliest Qur'an manuscripts to the historical critical so method. As objective so, as the gets. two million euro question, has the Qur'an been faithfully preserved? Because that's the bold Drum claim roll. Islam makes, right? Quote, verily, we, it is we who have sent down the dhikr, and surely we will guard it from corruption. For this, but if you look at the text, really look at the text and look at the early manuscripts, not many people are looking at them. The first thing that will strike you is that how similar they are. They are extremely similar. I mean, it's really a totally different story than, than with the New Testament, but even, you know, with, with like early, early uh, Hebrew Bible stuff, it's, it's much, much more chaotic. You can sense the surprise chaotic. in the professor's Did voice, you can't you, in terms of what he's encountered with these manuscripts. It was clearly a surprise. Yes, of course it was a surprise because if you look into the Christian sources into the New Testament, for example, the earliest gospel could be Mark and that was 70 years after Jesus. However, the manuscripts that we have are written in Greek and therefore they're not eyewitness accounts. They're not written by the apostles of Christ. They're written by Greek philosophers. Potentially, the apostles of Christ were fishermen and therefore they were highly likely illiterate. And even if they could have written, surely they could couldn't have written Greek. So therefore, yet again, you see that there is absolutely no comparison to the Islamic preservation. By way of comparison, he mentions the Zero. Hebrew Bible and the New Testament. But it's clear the Quran is in a league of its own. And then you look at the Quran and it's just it's the same thing over and over again. It's not just the same thing, you know, like in, in general lines. No, it's down, not just down to the words, it's down to the spellings, right? Even the specific spellings and sometimes really random spellings are copied faithfully over and over again. Sometimes a word can be spelled in two ways. But they'll always write in one place, in one way, in the other place, in another way. And you don't get any mixing in that early manuscript. So really, um, scribes took, took the utmost care to really carefully uh, copy these manuscripts. The professor is so taken aback by the level of meticulous attention to the process of preservation. And it's always amazing, of course, to see somebody objective or an outsider here that has no skin in the game. He's not a Christian trying to debunk Islam. But if you look at the Islamophobes, you look at the so-called Christian apologists on YouTube, you will see, of course, how they are attacking Islam over and over again. However, those claims are false. The professor is so taken aback by the level of meticulous attention to the process of preservation he observed in these early manuscripts. He grudgingly juggles the idea of the early Muslims doing something extraordinarily anachronistic, like a postmodern interfaith textual critique, they were all something unheard it. of until the post-enlightenment landscape of modern academia. Mm -hmm. but, you know, it's like, well, is, is that because of an example of the text? I don't know. Um, that, that is putting a lot of um, uh, faith in knowledge of textual problems in the person who ever composed the Quran. Um, which they may have, you know, um, but how, how aware were people of all of these issues? Uh now, obviously, being an academic, working within the framework of the historical method, he can't attribute this perfect preservation to a god, no matter the extraordinary things he stumbles upon That's exploring totally the Qur'an. He has to confine his answer to an academic one. It really does not matter if he attributes the preservation to God or not. We as Muslims, of course, attribute that preservation to God and nobody else. However, that being said, for me, yet again, the most beautiful thing here is that a somewhat atheistic person looks at the Quran and can objectively quantify that, yes, this has been preserved from the first day out on. Meanwhile, the Islamophobes are coping and seething. Anybody with an objective mind would, of course, see right from wrong. That's what he gets paid millions for. Theology just doesn't figure, I'm afraid. Um, but the Quran does take pains to say, you know, look, uh, you know, this, this text is in some way uh, protected from corruption and these previous texts were corrupted. So I think that, that you know, that was a kind of self-fulfilling prophecy. You know, if, if the Quran says it has to be, it has to be uh, preserved and it will be preserved, yeah, obviously uh, followers are going to try really hard to do so. And they do. I mean, they're actually very successful at it. So now that we know that he has found the Qur'an to be faithfully transmitted between the earliest scribes, does he also find the earliest manuscripts go back to the Uthmanic recension when, according to the Muslim sources, 
it was standardized. And then the question kind of becomes, okay, so, so when, when was this text standardized? We have an early standard text. And so just to be clear, we have hundreds of manuscripts and every single one of them are part of the same text type, the standard text, except for one, uh, which we'll get to in a second as well, but uh, I'll repeat it here as well. Uh, but all of them are the same text type and all of them are, you know, letter by letter, basically identical. Small changes here and there, of course, like, like it would always be, uh, but it's really, really carefully controlled for. Which suggests there was a common ancestor, so there was a single written text. People yeah, and moreover, as he mentioned, if there are slight differences, maybe due to dialect or whatnot, they're not as different as the Gospels are to each other. In John, for example, Jesus is exalted as the Alpha and the Omega. In the earlier Gospels, on the other hand, you have no mention of that. So even the Gospels themselves, they're contradicting each other in terms of storyline. And this cannot be said about the Quran whatsoever. Here in the Quran recited and writing down what they heard. No, 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 they had a written copy and that copy was distributed across the empire and that was copied and copied and copied extremely carefully to the point that, you know, there's barely any differences there. Mm -hmm. The text is identical. So the fact the there are hundreds identical. of manuscripts of the same text type, quote, identical letter by letter, suggests to him there was a common ancestor, a master text. He uses an interesting choice of words here, quote, they had a written copy, and that copy was distributed across the empire, and that copy was copied and copied extremely carefully, so the texts are identical. The fascinating thing here is, frankly, the extraordinary thing. That's exactly the journey the Qur'an underwent, according to the standard Muslim narrative. What do you know? Uthman radiallahu anhu standardized the text in 647 CE or thereabouts and distributed this master version throughout the empire and then the master text was carefully copied thereafter, subhanAllah. Interesting. So, we can safely say the professor does find the Qur'an to have been faithfully preserved. Now the professor will discuss when, as far as he can tell from the data, the standardization likely occurred. Remember the Muslim sources claim it happened in about 647 CE during the Khilafah of Uthman radiallahu anhu Keep this date in mind as we dive into the next clip. We have radiocarbon dated manuscripts, and radiocarbon dated manuscripts give you know dates in of, of these manuscripts from say uh, the late seventh century and uh, mid seventh century that that kind of era, and uh, we have multiple of those. Well, all of those descend from a single original text. So if they all descend from a single original text, that original text must have been even earlier, right? Because they've been copied from that. Exactly right. Um, which brings us very close to a date, say, around the 650s, and not much later than that. Earlier is techni technically possible, but we have yet to see real manuscripts that really fall out of line in a weird way. Yeah, around, around 650, um, which is perfectly in line with the traditional Muslim narrative about this. Um, who say that Uthman, the third caliph, uh, who reigned around the 650s, standardized Wait, the text and distributed the Muslims are not lying, you say? Across the Islamic Empire. How can that well, be? That seems to be what we see. Wow. That really seems, seems to be what happened. So, <laughs> Subhanallah. So Professor Marin van Putin is now explaining that the sheer number of identical texts and the fact that they've all been radiocarbon dated to a period between 650 and 700 CE suggests they have a common ancestor text that goes back even further into history to no later than 650 or perhaps even slightly earlier. The numbers are important because if you have the one text carbon dated to 650 to 700, that might be an anomaly, right? But with hundreds returning the same date, it makes it more likely and reliable. Now, the fact that these hundreds of texts are near identical also suggests they couldn't have been written randomly or in isolation, say from memory. It signals they were handwritten and there was also a scribal system in place ensuring standardization. Thirdly, if you have hundreds of identical texts in a period spanning 650 to 700, it suggests their master text must have existed prior that's to this said, yeah. period. Exactly right. Well, guess what? This places the standardization of the Quran remarkably at or just before 650 CE, which is almost precisely the same date to the year the Muslim sources, the ones that apparently aren't reliable, claim <laughs> Uthman radiallahu anhu standardized the Quran in 647 CE. Wow. Just wow. Yep. Subhanallah. That is a remarkable overlap.
between the Muslim claim and modern scholarship. It's kind of ironical, of course, that Muslims were claiming this for hundreds and hundreds of years and now finally, to the rescue, the West comes, pays a scholar 2 million euros and he simply confirms what we already knew. He is. Hey. Let's get something straight before we finish. <laughs> the European Research Council is a secular body governed by a scientific council and funded at a cost of 16 billion euros by some of the most liberal nations in the world in Western Europe. Its president is Maria Leptin, herself a molecular biologist. Ideologically, their mission is antithetical to religion, but they're going to be more averse to Islam because inside their paradigm, Islam is the least reformed and most in need of intellectual scrutiny. They don't exist to do any favours for religion. Let's True. not beat around the bush. Frankly, to them, the world is a better place without such superstition. Exactly. So this organisation, part of the European Commission, headquartered in Brussels, paying out millions of euros to intelligent people like our star linguist, Marin van Putin, is coming with the assumption that science is the solution for pretty much every problem it's their going. Savior, ultimately. And baked into this bias is the additional assumption that if enough clever people subject any religion to enough specialist scrutiny, that religion falls apart and is inevitably proven a man-made enterprise. That's exactly right. So, when the opposite happens and a 300-year strategy for science to take over the world is upended, and religion is shown in a positive light or somehow confirmed by a secular critical study, despite the vast amounts of cash and resources being thrown at it, you know for sure there was just too much incontrovertible evidence on the side of religion, in this case Islam, to warrant the findings the study concluded with. And too what were these today. findings? The Islamic sources are reliable when it comes to the Quranic narrative. The Qur'an was faithfully preserved. And the Uthmanic Codex does indeed go back to Caliph Uthman, who standardized the text in about 647 CE. Thank you for watching, and please subscribe for more latest scholarship supporting the standard Muslim narrative. All right, and this is it for today's video, guys. Please do me the favor and do not call Marjin Van Putin here. I'm sure he got a bunch of calls now from Muslims congratulating him on his findings. I'm sure it is well meant, but please hold your finger still. That being said, guys, we as Muslims, we already believe this and we know this to be true. However, in the West, people do not know that. And many Muslims are seen discarding the West and saying, we don't need their science to know that Islam is true. Of course, that is correct for us. However, for the Western mind, they are, of course, interested in science. Moreover, I would say that for many people in the West, science is their God. If science says it's true, they obey it right away. For them, science is their Quran, astaghfirullah, but it's really the case. Those people truly worship science, and therefore, if science confirms it, it makes them rethink. Therefore, it is well needed as well, and we should applaud the efforts of the West, of course, to scientifically try to debunk Islam because like that they're shooting themselves in their own foot and you see that Islam prevails yet again. Another common W for Islam. And moreover, as I said throughout the video, it is hilarious to see that the Islamophobes from the West try to debunk Islam with false claims. However, their own science, their own communities, their own intellectuals are debunking them. All right, guys, but this is it for today's video. If you liked it, leave it a thumbs up. If you haven't subscribed already, guys, please do so. And if you want to support this channel via Patreon, for example, all the links are in the description box below. Thank you so much for your ongoing support, guys. And as always, may God bless you all. Much love and peace.